Ed. So I'd like to introduce Steve Groff, um, the cover crop coach, who's joining me with us again this morning. Uh, today's topic is going to be using short season cash crops to plant cover crops earlier and exploring some of the benefits that those extra days or weeks of cover crop growth can provide. So with that, Steve would like to welcome you in and uh, turn the reins over to you for today's talk. Well, thank you so much, Conrad. Uh, consider it a, an honor to have this opportunity again to share some things about uh, cover cropping. And uh, the topic today is using short season cash crops. We're mainly going to be talking about corn and soybeans. It can be applied to other crops you may have. But using a shorter season cash crop with the goal of being able to plant cover crops earlier. So um, this is all about trying to find a wider planting window to plant cover crops. And I think most of us understand that uh, cash crops, particularly corn and soybeans, the genetics have been proved greatly with shorter season genetics, and that is one of the things that we can do. Actually, it's one of the easier things to be able to get cover crops planted in the fall. So um, in, in just looking over this and seeing these opportunities, I have a little graph or a little chart there that kind of shows what I'm talking about. If we get the correct short season genetics, we may be able to plant cover crops one week, two weeks, or even three weeks earlier. And that is huge. That is huge in the context of trying to get cover crops established. So um, my whole point in this is to think about how can we plant 5 to 10 percent of our acres with a faster maturing corn hybrid or soybean hybrid um, so that we can be able to get our cover crops planted sooner. Because one day in September, could indeed be worth seven days in October. And that's not essentially based on fact per se, but in, in my experience over the past uh, five years that I've really been looking at this, it's important to understand the dynamic of how every day counts, particularly in the month of September. Every day counts, and we need to get things planted on time because if we wait, we don't have the opportunity to grow our cover crop and take all the advantages that we want out of our cover crops. So uh, being able to do this is, is not that hard. It doesn't require a change in machinery. It doesn't uh, require a lot of changes other than the genetics. And so in some way, this is kind of an easier way to get cover crops planted. Uh, and get more of them planted. So we're going to kind of go over that, uh, some of those dynamics. I kind of backed into this maybe a little bit unintentionally, but in 2011, we planted um, about two acres of, uh, it was only replicated twice, but we used a 103-day corn hybrid versus a 111-day corn hybrid. Uh, the field was uh, about 1,500 feet long, and so it gave us a, some decent data. And when we harvested it, we actually got a 31 bushel per acre difference by planting that shorter season hybrid. And I pretty much chalked that up that year to it was the weather. And, and indeed, the way the weather sometimes falls, we all understand that there can be some uh, cycles in the weather and so forth that can favor a shorter season hybrid. And I pretty much, you know, chalked it off to that's maybe, you know, what we were talking about. But nonetheless, 31 bushels is very significant. We thought, you know what, let's just take this a step further um, and do it uh, a little bit more the following year. So just a little picture here to describe what we're looking at. <clears throat> What we had taken off uh, literally three weeks, or actually in this case it was a month earlier, the cover crop was already growing. And when we get back to our four season corn, in this case 111 day corn, you can see how we already had a cover crop growing. And as it turned out, that cover crop where that was growing was a higher yield. So 
Uh, this is really what led me to uh, move on to doing some more, more intentional testing. So what we did is we took a field, uh, we took several fields and took several uh, shorter season hybrids. Now I was working with a local regional company that sells corn in trying to pick some hybrids that they thought may indeed do well in our area of southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and and just to see where, what will work. Is this actually a concept that can be, that can provide a benefit to getting our cover crops planted sooner? So um, one thing I'll say, and it's noted there on top, is when you look at the plot data from any given corn company that they put out, they put their plots out, you will typically see that short season yield it may kind of impress you, but it really never wins the yield plot. And that's not really to be expected. But one of the, I guess you would say, pet peeves I have is those short season varieties were generally not harvested at optimal maturity like the later or longer season hybrids were, which they always usually come in and, and harvest that plot when the longer seasons are ready. And that shorter season may have been ready two or three or four weeks sooner. Now that doesn't always make any difference, but it can. And so I set out to harvest these plots at their optimal maturity. And you'll see uh, coming up here uh, uh, when, when we do that. And then as soon as they're planted, we'll go in and we'll plant a cover crop and then we evaluate that through the next year. So I'm going to throw a bunch of data slides coming up here soon so you can see it. I want to impress upon you that this data is replicated three times field length. And for me, field length is 500 to 1,500 feet long, just to give you an idea. And basically tell you that what we're not doing is doing little 50-foot or 100-foot little plots. We're not doing that. So um, just to show you where this data comes from here is very important. So as I said before, once we take out a short season hybrid, we'll come right in immediately and plant a cover crop. And that's a part of this test because we're looking not only at which short season genetics work, but how does this work in the context of a cover cropping system. So <clears throat> our target is to harvest at around 20% moisture. For our area, that's been determined to be uh, kind of a compromise between getting it dried down and, and potential field loss that could occur. So when, when we judge that our corn is around 20% moisture, that's when we go in to, to make the harvest. Now, in 2012, when we really expanded this, after my initial uh, positive results, as you can see there, we did over a dozen different hybrids to really look and to take a really serious look at it. And remember I said in 2011 that I thought it was the weather, and indeed it may have, and, and so forth. But 2012, you know, it wasn't that clear. But what is interesting, when you see across the different hybrids here and how they performed, it was fairly even. Um, in the context of the amount of hybrids that we tried. But when we broke it down to our shorter season corn and middle and longer, again, our shorter season corn did quite well. And it, uh, again, we thought, well, you know, we need to do this again. This is, this is pretty impressive. Um, so we took it to the next year in 2013. And even in 2013, we showed really good results on our shorter season maturities. And in this case, our control is the longer season corn. And uh, if you didn't pick up on it there, I'll just remind you that longer season is basically over 110 days. And uh, short is underneath 100 days. So um, as, you've, uh, as, as I, I firmly believe that any concept, particularly that maybe is weather related and so forth, you need to take it out at least three years to get a handle on it, to be fair to the concept and learn how to operate it. So 2014, we even expanded a little bit further. 
we got a little longer season corn, and we really got some shorter season corn. We got some 74-day uh, to 80-day corn um, just to see what would happen in our scenario. Well, kind of as expected, uh, we kind of fell off the cliff with the yields and those really, really short hybrids. Uh, but going back to the purple bars there with, the, with what we were calling our short season in that 80 up to 100, 83 to 100 uh, day corn, again, we, show, we had a strong showing. The mid-season was good, but in 2014, the long season corn clearly uh, out yielded everything else. And again, I could say that was probably a result of the growing conditions favoring a longer season hybrid. And um, if you look there, that 116 day did really good. Now, if you can imagine, by the time we got the plant cover crops in there, uh, it was getting fairly late. So if you look at this mid-November update here and a picture of the plots, this gives you a actual view of how things look and how we did this test. So the early corn that came off has nice growing cover crops. The later corn uh, was just, we just planted them so the cover crops weren't very highly established. So we're going to talk about coming up here about what is the value of having a cover crop planted earlier. I mean, it's one thing to say we can do it, but is there a value there? But if we take all these numbers and put them all together from the three years that I tested uh, dozens of hybrids, this is the three-year average, and I would say this is very realistic as to what you can expect with shorter season hybrids. And um, we are going to be talking about soybeans next, but in corn, we essentially, uh, over those three years, got about nine bushel less in our shorter season plots. Our mid, our mid uh, plots didn't do as good. Our long season actually turned out kind of what you would have expected uh, over all the three years, but it's impressive to get those 181 bushels out of those short season maturities. So, um, so this has led me to change what I do on my farm. And I'm going to explain a little bit more later. So what have we done in the, in the meantime? Well, last year in 2016, the company that I'm working with, a uh, regional company here, TA Seeds, they, there's enough of interest in this, and I'm speaking from the context of, of uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, there's enough interest in these short season hybrids performing mainly in the context of using this as a concept for cover crops, that they are testing now specific hybrids for this concept to be used. So <clears throat> on the left-hand side here, the one that yielded 196 bushels, that was a, a newer hybrid that I hadn't had here before, a 93-day. And then there's an 88-day there, the 194 bushels, that did quite well. Uh, the blue bars are the yields, the orange bars are the moisture, which you need to take that in consideration here when you're doing it. If you look over there to the right, we had that 185 day that we probably don't need to test that in again. We want to weed that one out. But the new experimental there, the 88 day, that looks very competitive. So <clears throat> we're seeing cover crop, excuse me, we're seeing corn companies now uh, being more interested in this. And um, I was just at a meeting the other day where there's uh, happened to know a local Pioneer uh, sales rep. And I asked him, I had this same presentation there, and afterwards I asked him what he's seeing in his, in his market, which is locally around here. He said about 20% of the hybrids that he's selling now are what are considered shorter season hybrids. Um, I will give some context to that. In our area here of southeastern Pennsylvania, about 60% of the ground is in cover crops, so it's a very high adoption rate, and a lot of that is because of the Chesapeake Bay. 
So the interest in cover crops, these farmers are beyond primed. I mean, they're ready, they understand the value of cover crops. To have the availability of good, strong, shorter season genetics is, is where this is coming to, to be more established as a tried and true uh, practice in, in these areas. So I want to shift over and talk about some specific data on soybeans, and I'll pause for any questions anybody may have. Um, but this is just to show you how the plots look, where we were, uh, as you will see, we were testing uh, from, we actually, some years we tested down into some group one beans uh, all the way to up to group, uh, high group threes and group fours. So this just can show you what the plots look like and show you how they're replicated and that the data we get out of here is pretty good. In 2013, when we did beans, <clears throat> you can see the group numbers across the bottom of the screen. You can also see there's variation among them. And my point in showing that is that you don't just go and buy the shortest season genetics that are in the book. There are, just like in every other aspect of varieties, there are certain varieties that will do well in your area for whatever reason. So once you start getting comfortable with these, it's, it's, um, it's something that you can then begin to rely on. And I'll just mention, backing up to the corn, there is one hybrid that I've used for five years now that's considered the standard. It does well every year. It's an 89-day variety and it is always, always at the top. And so that's kind of my standard that I, that I use in this. And then in uh, 2014, we expanded that. Uh, yields are off a little bit this year, but look at that 2.2 bean, um, highest yield in the plot. But you can also see some beans there that uh, weren't as good, um, and that's probably just genetics uh, for my area. But as you look across there, we have some potential. Um, anything below two in my area is not seeming to work, so it's important that you start that if you're if you're doing this, there is there is probably a a place where you can fall off the cliff. Um, but uh, having said that, this is this is where you need to have a seedsman to understand what's going on, and 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 everything. So <clears throat> I will say that in 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 our region, there has been a clear shift. Uh, in going to a significant percentage of soybeans and corn that is now being planted intentionally to be able to get cover crops planted. Now this is just another picture later on in the year when that, uh, that same field that I showed you before, now it's planted in the cover crops and you can kind of see where the early beans came off and uh, and where the later beans were, you can see the different uh, growth in cover crops. And, and again, we didn't want to just take this for one year, so we measured the biomass that came off those areas where we planted. If you look across the bottom, you'll see dates. It starts with September the 10th, goes down to no, uh, September the 30th. What the bars represent is the tons of biomass that we measured the following spring when we planted corn into these um, plots. So we kept the plots identified through the fall into the spring. And um, when we planted in the spring, we took measurements. So by planting, essentially the bottom there sums that up. But planting two and a half weeks earlier in September, we essentially doubled the cover crop biomass the following spring. Remember I said that one day in September is worth maybe up to seven days in October? Well, this is partly why I'm using that analogy because you can actually see here how that can play out. But I'm a farmer and, uh, you know, biomass doesn't pay my bills. So that's cool, but what about yields? Well. We planted one hybrid across all the plots. Now this is the soybean field. Now we're talking about one hybrid of corn. We continued to remain, keep the identity of all those previous plots uh, intact. 
when we harvested that following year, this is the year two short season effect, no change in fertilizer or anything like that, um, we essentially got a yield bump by planting, uh, by planting our, simply because we got our cover crops planted earlier. So in this case, about a seven bushel increase, simply because we had our cover crops planted earlier the year before. Now remember back when I told you what the three year average was, we essentially got a little about nine bushels less from our short season compared to long season. Well, I could argue right here that we're making up for that the following year. And yes, it's two bushels short, um, but that being said, there's a lot of other benefits that can be included in, in planting cover crops earlier. So I just gave you a whole bunch of data. I'm going to open it up. Uh, Conrad, you can just uh, let me know about what questions were asked. And then I'm going to kind of go through and, 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 and in some sense summarize uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, what specific questions uh, might you have? Yeah, thank you, Steve. I'll uh, I'll bring everybody's mics back up here. So if you want to ask a question live, you can do that. We'll take about five minutes here for questions. Uh, one question came in here, Steve, uh, from Jerry Hall. Uh, have you investigated using short season hybrids to plant later in the spring? So you're saying letting our I think Jerry, what you're referring to is letting your cover crop grow out and grow you know longer. Um, the answer is I have not done research on that, but I think that that would that would actually have some merit. Maybe maybe you just stimulated me to think about doing that this year, um, because I I do firmly agree that that would be an aspect that is important. It's kind of we talked last week about planting green, and letting your cover crops grow longer. So I don't have data for that, Jerry, but uh, certainly something we should look into. I mean, I, I, typically that's the reason a lot of times short season cash crops were used in case the weather is is uh, prolonged to be wet and you can't get in the field that you switch out a hybrid to grow a shorter season crop so you get it matured on time for the fall. So I do not have data on that. Um, that being said, that's definitely something that should be looked into. Any other questions, uh, feel free to pop on here and ask it live. One question I had, Steve, was I know it's not a particular issue in your part of the country, uh, but I know in some areas um, there can be a lot of concern about the heat of the summer affecting uh, the corn's ability to pollinate. And so using different genetics can lower risk in the cash crop. Have you observed anything like that where by using different length hybrids, you're lowering the risk to your cash crop? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's been something that larger acreage farmers have indeed been doing, that been doing to a certain extent. But most of them have not got into the sub 100 day genetics that I'm talking about here. Uh, so that is a, actually I'm going to mention that coming up here, it's a, it's a hedge against weather risk. And that in itself is reason enough to plant 5 or 10 percent of your acreage. Uh, in this case here, we're trying to do it to incentivize people to think about planting their cover crops earlier. So. Um, so absolutely, we never know what the weather is going to be, and so spreading out your risks over that unknown factor is certainly uh, a good management technique. Excellent. Okay, well if there's no other questions, very good Steve, let's move forward and we'll take questions again at the very end. Okay, um, I'm just going to, now that I showed you and presented you to the data, just some other things uh, to think about. 
and some of the advantages now planting cover crops earlier because that's really what we're talking about here. I alluded to uh, increased cover crop growth. Uh, of course, areas that have a concern for erosion, soil erosion with water or wind, definitely a good reason to plant cover crops earlier. Uh, opportunity to scavenge more nitrogen and save that nitrogen to keep it in your fields rather than either going out of tile line or washing off in the rivers or streams or what have you. Uh, especially if we have legumes, being able to create more nitrogen production. And then this is a big one here, having the availability of, of more species because we had that earlier planting window. And I know this varies depending what part of the country you're in, but even just two weeks earlier can just, maybe there's five more species that you might be able to plant. And if you're planting mixes and what have you, that's just an opportunity to get some more diversity into your ground, into your soil. Uh, another one is to potentially have a higher nutrient credit and, and that, I put a question mark there because it's a little hard at this point we haven't been able to totally identify how much nutrients are you saving and the following year how much can you reduce your rates, particularly in something like nitrogen. And there is so many variables that go into every different farm and almost every different field that this comes down to a farm by farm or a field by field basis. And what I encourage farmers to do is if you, if you have um, yield monitors and, and you can uh, also with uh, GPS, you can set out some plots in the spring with your planter or with the way if you, have, if you have fertility on the planter, you can adjust the rates or if you're coming back in and, and side dressing or whatever, work with your rates a little bit and then you can look at your yield maps at the end and to see what works in your farm because if I tell you that you plant a mixed cover crop and you can get, uh, you can use 20 pounds less nitrogen or 40 pounds or 50 pounds less nitrogen, that may indeed work on a given field. It may not on another field. Uh, that's just what I've found. And there's, there's no tried and true recipe that I'm aware of yet that we can really get fine tuned on this. Now there's soil health tests that are being available and they're, they're, they are part of trying to figure this out. Um, but I think that's some of the things that we need to really focus on in the years to come and, and how we get this uh, nutrient credit and to increase that uh, be, by getting our cover crops planted earlier. And then I have here better yields the following year. I mean, of course, that's what we're hoping for and I've certainly seen some of that, uh, but that's going to pretty much depend, you know, on a field-by-field -field basis. So um, here's some other things you may not have thought of. In a lot of regions, if you're able to get your cash crop harvested earlier, you may catch a premium in, in the price. Um, and that has to do with your local basis and everything. Uh, it's a very real uh, uh, thing that happens around here where our price uh, can can be 20 to 40 cents higher weeks before uh, the main harvest comes in, and so that can be an advantage there to get to get your to get a higher price, uh, if at least or anything like that. Uh, another thing is that it's really uh, nice if you're delivering your grain to go to the grain elevator and there's no lines. I mean, there's times where we've been shelling corn here and, and we come in three, four times in a day. We're the only trucks in. And uh, anyway, that's, that's a minor thing, but yet it is kind of nice. Um, another thing is get your combine set and ready to go. You might not have the pressure to do 5,000 acres in the next month, you know, and uh, you can go in and start and, 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 uh, and get that early corn off, get everything, get the whole system in, in progress. Um, and of course, Sometimes we'll get potential, potentially can get storms or bad weather uh, later in the fall. That's always uh, an issue that, that can occur. And um, 
Also, this is kind of amusing, but who doesn't want to be the first in a neighborhood to begin harvest? I mean, you know, bragging rights. That's uh, that's nice to have once in a while. It makes people talk about what you're doing. Um, I know in our area here, people are kind of getting used to me because I sh we show up there pretty much first uh, when we when we deliver our corn. So, um, so that's just another aspect. Uh, some of the aspects to to consider in that, but. Um, it's just more, there's, there's some different elements to this that I think are very compelling to, to, uh, to, to create that wider uh, planting window, to try to get your cover crops planted in September the 15th instead of October the 15th, at least on a few acres. Um, so I, um, here's some of the things now that, that I have learned uh, over the years. You need to choose the shorter season genetics based on a knowledgeable advice and experience. And again, you don't just buy the shortest uh, hybrid variety that's in the book. Uh, you want to have someone that knows what they're doing, at least to start, and then to, to see which short season genetic in your area is going to work. Another thing, make sure the disease package is appropriate for your area. Um, in our area here, we tend to have high humidity and so forth in August, uh, well, July and August, so disease is, is resistance is important. So I can't just get a hybrid from, let's just say, uh, a shorter season hybrid from um, north central U.S., where, let's just say, North Dakota doesn't tend to have the humidity we do. It could be a great hybrid there, but you bring it here and I'll get disease. And that's one thing we noticed in some of these short season genetics we use, they got riddled with disease and then we saw subsequent yield loss. So that's important to, to know that. Another thing is to harvest when it's ready. And it may catch up on you because when you have nice warm, dry days, the end of August and it's drying down, you can go from 22% to 18% in almost a week or 10 days sometimes. And I know I heard of one guy in Virginia that had caught him off guard and, and he said he wasn't ready to go. Uh, his corn was 17% and uh, he wasn't ready to go. And it's like, well, you're missing a lot of opportunity there. I mean, that was just a preparation thing there. He wasn't ready to go. Um, so you want to monitor your moisture levels in your crop regularly as, as the harvest nears. So short season genetics can dry down faster than you may be used to. There's one thing I want to mention that I did not write down, um, and that is the best fields, if you can arrange this, the best fields for you to try this are probably on your more well-drained fields, if you have any like that. And that's Maybe some of the reason why my shorter season genetics show up so good because I have well-drained soil, which means that when it's wet, we can usually plant a little sooner. When it's dry, we get dry a little sooner. So I may statistically over the years here just simply tend to run out of background moisture with my long season genetics that I can't utilize some of the genetic ability for higher yields. So that is something that I have observed in different plots and different parts of the country. If you have really good deep soils, you may not get as strong as an effect as I got here. So I hope you're able to understand that because I know it may be a little complex. but. Uh, so I would suggest if you have more well-drained fields, that's where you want to go with your shorter season genetics. And besides, they probably need cover crops more anyway to try to bring them up. So that's just one of the kind of thought process, processes through all this. And the other thing too, you got, you're setting yourself up to get your cover crop planted earlier. That's the whole point of why we're talking about this. Do you have a plan in place to plant behind the combine or as soon as possible? Do you have your cover crop seed purchased and delivered or at least talk to your cover crop supplier 
saying you're going to be harvesting corn in two weeks. I'm thinking about X amount of acres here to plant. Can you have that delivered to me? So that, that requires a little homework because they're not used to maybe providing cover crop seeds earlier. They may not even be ready. So you need to do a little planning here to make sure this, this works. And then is your planning equipment ready to go? Do you have your drills ready to roll? or your planners or whatever you're using. And then also personnel. And this is probably one of the more challenging things um, about this. And I've heard it said more than once, we have all hands on deck for harvest. And I get that. I understand that. But I tell you, I've heard it also more than once. When guys start seeing the benefits of cover crops and getting them planted earlier, somehow, some way, they find the people to do it. And um, so I think that's kind of where it's at. Um, one of the concepts here, and it may not work out every year this way, but if you plant your short season crop, you can get in there, get it off, and your mid-season hybrids aren't quite ready yet. So you may have a week in there to start planting right away. So sometimes that may work out fine. You don't need any other personnel. So just a few little tips there in how to make that work. And um, I also just put a slide in here. This should be your view when planting cover crops. Follow the combine. So I'm sitting there in a the tractor planting my cover crops right behind the combine. And if that's what you can do or as soon as the combine leaves your field, then you're maximizing this opportunity to be able to do that. So a few other things as I wind up here for you to consider uh, this too and why this is such a good reason to consider. Planting costs are the same no matter when you plant. It costs the same. So there's no difference in the planting costs. Also it takes the same amount of time no matter when you plant. Understood, a little more busy here during this time, but it takes the same amount of time. Seed cost is the same. So making, a, to, to be able to get the advantage here is when you plant. It can make a huge difference. Remember what I said at the beginning, one day in September is worth up to a week in October. So being able to set yourself up for success is what this is all about. Um, and so it's just it's just important to to realize you know how this all works out. Um, I just simply ask if you can find short season genetics that can be close to yielding what your normal is, why not? And I think that's easy to agree to. The challenge is finding out those short season genetics. I think they're out there and they're close enough that this is worth it to do. Um, I always say treat your cover crops like your cash crops. And, and here we're trying to, to systematically and strategically manage our cover crops like we do our cash crops. Then we can better take advantage of the many things that cover crops have to offer that are magnified by planting earlier. And I've said this a half dozen times, I'll say it again, one day in September may be worth up to seven days in October. So this is a kind of a reward that we want to have for our efforts. This happens to be a picture I took in that uh, plot where we tested 14 hybrids under 93 days in 2016. This is November the 11th, nice and green, beautiful and growing. Um, at this point, we're planning on testing about a dozen hybrids again. In 2017, we're, we're taking the three top ones that we had in 2016, adding a few more, and just seeing what we can find, what we can learn to be able to uh, plant a shorter season genetic. So my challenge is why not try some shorter season hybrids next year on just 5% of your acres. That may just be one field. It may be several fields. Um, maybe you want to go for a little bit more. Don't go too crazy on it because you got to learn what works in your area. So with that, um, 
that's all I have to share. Um, Conrad, if there's any um, other questions, I will just put up here while we wait. Our next week, we're going to have our guest, our first guest speaker, Dan Towery. He's going to be talking about interseeding cover crops into knee-high corn. So I just want to remind us of that on the screen. So I'll turn it back to you, Conrad, if there's any questions. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for leaving us with that challenge on, uh, you know, trying a new practice like this on 5% of acres. I think that's uh, a reasonable amount of land to try, something new like this. Um, I have unmuted everybody's mics here, so if you do have a question, feel free to unmute your phone or your headset and uh, jump on and ask a question. One question I had, Steve, um, that maybe you could speak to. Uh, you said, you know, several times that a day in September can be worth, you know, several multiple days in October of, of volume of growth. Um, what about species selection? Can you plant different types of cover crops, you know, when you're using short season genetics than if you were planting after a full length uh, corn hybrid? Absolutely. In September, the amount of species that can be planted is exponentially more. And it kind of, they peel off as you go through the months of September into October. And that is another benefit and reason why you want to try to be able to get, uh, create that opportunity to plant uh, cover crops sooner. So you can take advantage of that diversity because I think it's, uh, we all agree that diversity is good, and um, we all fully understand the benefits of crop rotation. When we start mixing several species together, that's like crop rotation on steroids. So um, we, can, we, can, we can achieve that. And just kind of on that note, um, in, in mixes, is that's another kind of plug for mixes where when we're starting to get on the edge of when a cover crop's planting window is closing, if we have a mix, we can just put a few pounds or just a small percentage of a given cover crop in there. And in case we have a good fall or a decent fall, we'll be able to utilize that. But again, it's all about setting yourself up for maximizing opportunities of using cover crops. Mm -hmm. Very good. Would be interested in, in hearing from anybody here who has experimented with these techniques or even has a challenge to, to if this can work in the area. This is a place where we can air out questions and concerns as well. So any other questions or thoughts? I would just say one thing, Conrad, I saw that Lauren posted here about he had some corn planted two weeks later but it was essentially the same uh, uh, maturity when frost hit. And again, sometimes that does have to do with the way weather patterns are. And I think that was kind of in a uh, in a response to Jerry Hall's question about um, planting a shorter season hybrid later in the spring, essentially allowing your cover crop to grow out more and get these benefits that way. So um, I think this whole thing of, of juggling maturities and our cash crops uh, there's probably even more things that I even listed, but it's certainly something worth considering, and I think a very easy way to be able to get more cover crops planted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if there is no more questions, uh, we will uh, we will go ahead and uh, and wrap this up. Uh, let's see here. Okay, very good. So thank you everybody for your participation. Uh, like you can see on the slide there, um, the next webinar uh, will be on Tuesday uh, again at eleven o'clock Eastern, and Dan Towery will be joining us and speaking about interceding into knee high corn. I uh, heard Dan speak several times, an excellent speaker, uh, very knowledgeable on cover crops and has a lot of data and a lot of research to back up, you know, what he talks about. So 
If you guys have found this group to be useful, um, or you know people who may be experimenting with interceding early into corn, uh, invite them to join the group. Uh, next week would be a great time for them to join in and hear Dan join the conversations uh, that we're having. So with that, we'll wrap up today's webinar. Uh, we'll be circulating a recording, and um, yeah, look forward to uh, coming together next week again. Thank you, and have a great week.